it's a new day and I am going to be talking about two older classes of antidepressants and their general mechanism and things like that. These are not used nearly as often anymore due to just having better products now. But the first one is our OG, our monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And how these work is exactly how it sounds. So these inhibit the enzyme monoamine oxidase. And there are two different kinds of monoamine oxidase, A and B. And when we inhibit those enzymes, irreversibly, as all American products that are MAOIs are irreversible inhibitors, then we cause the uh, concentrations of our monoamine neurotransmitters to increase in the neuronal synapse. So this includes norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Now, the reason why we don't use these very often anymore is due to challenges, particularly with food interactions. So these don't play well with other products that increase things like dopamine and norepinephrine. They also don't play well with certain types of food that can mimic or affect the body's use of monoamines. Truly, these tend to be reserved for treatment resistance. So people who've tried a number of products without good success and are able to really abide by some of the restrictions that we see with the products themselves. So how they work, as you can see, we have MAOA that is sitting here. MAOB is the, uh, the one that's more associated with um, actually treatment benefit, but we have enzymes in the synaptic cleft as well as inside of the nerve cells that um, when inhibited, allow for more neurotransmitter to be available. Our products, the most common ones that you will see include trenylcypramine or Parnate, phenylzine or Nardil, isocarboxazid or Marplan, and selegiline or MSAB. Now, selegiline we see a little bit more often. It has a, a transdermal or a patch formulation, and that patch formulation can be um, useful for Parkinson's disease as well. So by inhibiting MAO, we uh, can have an increase in the availability of dopamine, which can help treat Parkinson's disease. From a side effect perspective, it's pretty similar from a tolerability standpoint to a lot of our newer products. We do tend to see low blood pressure and dizziness. Um, it can cause some anticholinergic effects, not as much as our tricyclics. There is some risk of liver injury. We see headache. We see risk of sexual dysfunction. So fairly similar from how it's tolerated standpoint. But really the big reason why they're not used very often is because of things like this. So our food interaction. So essentially, when we consume products that have what's called tyramine in it, tyramine will replace and kind of confuse the body um, when it comes to the interchangeability with norepinephrine. So tyramine gets uh, confused with norepinephrine and will overstimulate or overexcite our noradrenergic or nor norepinephrine receptors. And when those get overexcited, then we see significant increases in blood pressure, which can cause a headache, it cause nausea, sweating, right, stiffness in the neck, and can be quite dangerous. If your blood pressure goes very high, you start to become at risk of things like stroke, um, uh, we call end organ damage, so like hurting your kidneys, hurting your liver, et cetera. So there's a lot of foods that can contain dietary tyramine, and they're like all the fun foods. <laughs> so certain types of cheeses, wine, uh, certain types of beer, fermented foods like sauerkraut, for example, things that have monosonium glutamate or MSG in them, uh, certain quantities of coffee or chocolate. Now, it's not all global how much you can have of each thing, and it depends on the kind as well. So certain cheeses are fairly safe and certain cheeses are not at all. So it gets really tricky. And the, the risk of consuming too much dietary tyramine can be quite dangerous. So patient education is really key. Education is really key. Now, one way to kind of remember, um, essentially... <laughs> In one way, products that have lots of uh, dietary tyramine, this is not inclusive, but it's a nice little Easter egg I wanted to share. So this is Hannibal Lecter. And Hannibal Lecter was a primary character in the Silence of the Lambs. Older movie, if you haven't seen it, recommend. It's for adults, I would say. Uh, so if you aren't squeamish and love these kinds of you know thriller type movies, fun, fun movie to watch. And a famous quote from... The Silence of the Lambs by Hannibal Lecter is a census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. This Chianti wrong, but I digress. So what's interesting about this 
is he was a psychiatrist before he was uh, arrested and, and, you know, did, did not so good things. And all of these things, the liver, fava beans, Chianti, are all things that contain high levels of dietary tyramine. And why that's interesting for the day, like the time frame that this was made, it was a time in which MAOIs were pretty globally used, like pretty, pretty largely used. And most people who had a mental health condition may have been prescribed an MAOI. By saying that all of these things he took, um, uh, you know, as, as a food item, it really insinuates that he was not taking his his medication either. So it's kind of a, an interesting little, little trivial Easter egg there. Now, moving into our tricyclic antidepressants, these are going to be a little bit more likely to run into in every day. Um, however, um, really often tricyclic antidepressants are used for non-depression related conditions. So um, we see it sometimes used for migraine prophylaxis, although that's fallen out of favor with uh, the advent of better products for that. Um, sometimes we'll see uh, low doses for sleep. Again, we have other products for that as well now, Neur uh, neuropathic pain. Um, but really, the, the use of tricyclic antidepressants has really, really started to decline over the last couple of decades. Now, tricyclic antidepressants, unfortunately, don't follow the same nomenclature for the name. It tells us how it works pharmacologically. But essentially, it's a, an SNRI, so serotonin and norepinephrine modulator. But in addition to that, it has what I call garbage pharmacology, right? So it antagonizes histamine, so it has antihistaminic effects, which can cause sedation, uh, weight changes. It has alpha adrenergic effects that can affect blood pressure and um, antimuscaritic effects, which can cause those anticholinergic drying effects. Additionally, it they have sodium channel blocking properties in our cardiac cells. And what that can do is actually act as an as it initially potentially an antiarrhythmic, but also arrhythmogenic, right? So when we block cardiac sodium channels, it actually will prolong a piece of your cardiac electrophysiology, the QRS complex. And when you widen that QRS complex, that starts to destabilize the rhythm of the heart. In addition to that, when we use antidepressant doses of these products, and you give a month's supply, that can actually be kind of dangerous in the sense of if someone were to take an overdose compared, say, with sertraline or compared with venlafaxine, the toxicity in overdose is significantly higher. So again, not as safe, not as well tolerated, kind of works the same. So that's why we don't use these nearly as often anymore. So pictorial stuff, same idea, right? So we have effects on a histamine receptor. We have effects on the uh, uh, muscarinic receptor that really can, kind of uh, causes some challenges when it comes to adverse effects with its drying effects, its sedation, its uh, potential for weight gain. The most common tricyclic antidepressants that we run into are listed here. So we have amitriptyline or Elevil, imipramine or tofranil, doxepin or cinequin, which if you've followed the sleep stuff, we've seen that one before, clomipramine or anaphranil, disipramine or norpramine, and nortriptyline or pamelor. So things to remember really from this is the side effect stuff, right? And I'm going to like kind of back up out of the way real quick. So boop. Oh God. Hold on. I'm hiding. There you go. <laughs> Just trying to make it entertaining, right? So what we see is um, drying effects from the anticholinergic, weight gain and sedation from the antihistaminic effects. And then when alpha-1 receptors are antagonized, it actually causes um, the uh, blood vessels to be kind of dilated to expand and the blood pressure can drop. And that can result in what we call reflex tachycardia and orthostasis. So that reflex tachycardia will cause the heart rate to go up to try to compensate for that lower blood pressure. And orthostasis is when, you know, if you've ever stood up really fast and you got that kind of whoosh, rushing feeling, that's orthostasis, right? So that drop in blood pressure, increase in heart rate because your body wasn't able to maintain an appropriate uh, blood pressure. And that can result in things like dizziness, falls, etc. Trying to think if there's anything else I want to say. I don't think so. That's your tricyclics and your MAOIs.